So I, as I said, I'm Jessica Mack. I'm a historian of Mexico. I teach at Rowan University in New Jersey, and I also teach more broadly about Latin America and the Caribbean. I also am in charge of a new digital humanities and digital history program at Rowan. So as a digital scholar, I've done a lot of work in um, digital public history, archival research methods, and how those intersect with the digital, especially as a postdoc for the archival research management tool Tropy, an open source tool many of you may be familiar with that came out of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason. And I tell that background just to give a little bit of context of sort of where I'm going as I'm gonna present the project I'll talk about today. It's very much based in the archival and I'm really interested in, in thoughts others have on, on using archival materials and particularly archival imagery with digital tools and digital approaches um, and what, what new things we can learn from, from that intersection. Um, I've also been exploring multilingual digital humanities recently and finding some intersections there. And so this will be um, a bilingual project, English and Spanish project. Um, so this project, essentially what it tries to do is apply digital mapping and spatial history methods to aerial imagery of 1950s Mexico City to better understand the process of building a campus for the National Autonomous University of Mexico, or Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, UNAM. Um, and this, this campus is, of course, very well known as Ciudad Universitaria. So that's what I'll be talking about today. The project's spatial approach really seeks to illuminate the institution's shifting role in Mexico's developing revolutionary state in the mid 20th century. And it demonstrates the ways in which new national priorities were inscribed upon the campus environment and its surrounding. So I'm using visualization of this campus building project from above to better understand both the construction process, but also some of the negotiations over space and urban development in Southern Mexico City that were catalyzed by this university. Georectification methods and mapping visualizations can really help reveal the stories of communities that lived in this region before the campus was built. And so my ultimate hope for this project and for this presentation is that this work with aerial imagery can provide some tools for other researchers and students to study their own campuses in Mexico, the US and elsewhere throughout the world and really reckon with questions of exclusion, displacement, and memorialization on these types of institutional sites that I think these are questions that are central to debates on many campuses today. So just a little bit of historical background. Many of us may be familiar, but not all of us. Um, I often ask my students, what is the oldest university in North America? And I get a lot of hands up saying Harvard and William and Mary, um, especially when I ask students in the United States, of course. But of course, the, the oldest university is the Royal and Pontifical University of Mexico, um, founded in 1551 in Mexico City under Spanish colonial rule. This university occupied several buildings in Mexico's historical center, um, and it continued to occupy those buildings for the better part of 400 years. You can still visit a lot of those buildings today. So I kind of start by this question with this question as a way to think about um, the different mo global models of higher education that we might think about if we're, if we're thinking about university campuses. Um, and there are many different global models of what that looks like. By the 20th century, of course, this institution had been renamed the National Autonomous University of Mexico. It was a secular public university run by the Mexican state. And Mexico, of course, underwent a lot of change in the early 20th century after the Mexican Revolution. So in this project, I'm really asking questions about the role the university played in supporting or opposing the new revolutionary state. Um, and I think these questions can apply again to many institutions sort of what are the relationships between universities and political power. Following the Mexican Revolution, planners and statesmen proposed building a new independent campus for the National University that would unite not only the institution, but the fractured post-revolutionary nation. So in 1950, they begin building a massive 2,500-acre campus known as University City, Ciudad Universitaria, in the southern area of Mexico City, originally intended for 50,000 students, but which almost 200,000 students attend um, today. So this is the, the idea of education at this institution is that it would be free for, um, for Mexican citizens. Sorry, I skipped ahead for a second. Um, what could this new space for public higher education and the process of building it tell us about the institution, the state, and the Mexican public during this period? So these are some of the questions that are kind of undergirding 
this digital project. The idea is that the spatial and intellectual reconfiguration of the university testify to changing priorities in Mexico's revolutionary government at mid-century. For this project, I spent a lot of time in paper archives, of course, in Mexico City, and I found one really interesting collection of aerial photo prints that were taken during the construction process, or looking at one of them here on the screen right now. I was able to use these prints to compare and corroborate with architectural plans, correspondence, and other documentary evidence. So I'd like to say a word before I show you more of these materials for the project, um, just a word about aerial photography and kind of the idea of aerial photography as um, a source, but also a technology in and of itself and, and what its uses have been. If we look at the history of aerial photography, um, it was really originally developed for reconnaissance purposes, right? Um, surveillance, we did have some aerial photography from balloons in the 19th century, but we mostly tend to kind of situate it as a 20th century technology and um, particularly kind of gets off the ground in during World War I. Um, prior to that, we did have a few really interesting experiments with pigeons wearing cameras, as you can see on the left. This is one of my favorite photos uh, from 1903 in Germany. Um, this pigeon was not in Mexico City, but um, I show these to kind of give us a sense that there's a long history of taking images from above. And of course our technology has, has really improved in taking those images and taking higher quality images. In recent years, um, we're using this kind of technology much more for environmental studies, archaeology, and the like. But in the 20th century, it really was what we might call a war technology and a surveillance technology. Um, and of course, on the right hand side here, you can see the Corona satellite images that were taken for US intelligence during World War, during the Cold War, rather, um, particularly in Latin America, but in many places throughout the world. So I see these aerial photos if of Mexico City as in a way a form of statecraft. They exemplify not only seeing like a state but kind of taking photos like a state. They were intended to survey the land and promote the urban development projects at this time of prosperity in Mexican history. Um, but aerial photo photography really became more common during this period in Mexico. It was easier to do. It became a favorite tool of the government to document their architectural and infrastructure projects. So I see these photos not only as artifacts sort of documenting the construction process, but also kind of artifacts of the universities and the state strategies themselves of promoting their own, um, their own work and their own modernization process. They display a vision of modern Mexico, and sometimes they also display the uneven benefits of that vision. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the context of this process, this, this digital project in particular. As I walk through a few aerial photos here, you'll kind of get a sense of the space and the landscape around Southern Mexico City on this periphery of the capital where the campus was built. So starting here in 1949, this would have really been the periphery, the Southern periphery and Southern edge at this point of the city. The site had been selected at this point, but the first stone had not yet been placed on the campus. So we're seeing a lot of wide open space, of course. Um, as we move forward here in 1950, construction is already well underway on the campus. So you can see in the foreground, the foundations of the Olympic Stadium that would host the 1968 Olympics in Mexico. Um, we can see a lot of new roads, new infrastructure that's coming in. And it's clear from this photo that the ath athletic facilities were going to be very prominent and take up a lot of space on the campus. So we're, we're starting to see sort of allocation of space during this period. Now, the next few photos I'll show are ver vertical bird's eye view photos. And these are the photos that are actually the raw material for the digital georectification project that I'm working on. Um, so this one is actually showing us 1946 before construction on the campus began, kind of gives a sense of the very rocky landscape in this area. And as I flip through these images, I just encourage you to think about what, what you're seeing, what's changing. Um, here we're in 1951, and we can see campus construction is underway again, um, but not completed. Again, we're seeing some of those roads that I talked about and different pathways through the space. Um, we're seeing still a lot of really wide open space around the campus. 1953, we're seeing, first of all, it's a sharper image. So some of the image quality also varies over time, but we're seeing some more completion of the campus, but still a lot of wide open space. Um, as we get to 1965, I'm going to fast forward a bit. 
we can see that the city has rapidly developed around the campus site. So whereas it was decidedly outside the urban footprint when building began, by 65, the university is a node of urban development surrounded by commerce, roads, real estate, and public transit. So there's a kind of a larger story here about the urban history of Mexico City. Um, these aerial images are valuable sources for visualization, but they're also primary sources that contain a lot of important information from their historical moment and can illuminate some major questions about university development related to land acquisition, displacement, et cetera. So just a couple of um, sort of demonstrative photos here about this digital project, which is still in progress, but what it's going to look like. To give you a sense, I'm doing a lot of um, layered mapping. We're working on georectification, as I mentioned, and the idea is to really be able to visualize the construction project as it unfolded and identify important spatial changes that marked the decisions and priorities of the planners. Um, so one of these major stories, as I alluded to, is about displacement, and I'd like to just speak briefly about that um, before I close. Many of you may be familiar with the concept of the ejido, but some of you probably won't be, so I'll just define it. An ejido is a plot of land that was essentially the unit of land redistribution in Mexico after the revolution. Mexico underwent a pretty substantial agrarian reform process there. Um, so when I talk about the ejido or the ejidatarios, or those would be the inhabitants of these um, land plots. Land redistribution was an important demand and promise of the Mexican Revolution, one that was, was fulfilled in part, but never, never completely fulfilled. Um, so this is an important thing for us to understand when we dig into the history of this campus and learn that the campus was actually built on ejido land. So the, the ejidos were expropriated in order to build the campus. This photo here, we're seeing a, a photo of university officials meeting with those, those residents, those inhabitants, um, ejidatarios, as they were called, of those um, communal land plots in 1943. So this is a, an agricultural community of very humble origins, many of them of indigenous descent. And they became kind of a, an accident of fate, became kind of very, very important for this major state project. They came into very close contact with the highest levels of the Mexican federal government and wind up making a deal with the university to turn over this land. Um, this wound up being a very good deal for the university, which had surveyed other sites, but could acquire this land um, much more cheaply. Um, and because the land was rocky, it was not really very well suited for agriculture. So there, that's sort of some of the backstory there. Unfortunately, shortly after the expropriation was signed, um, some problems start to appear. And I track these in the archive and also in the digital project with letters from this community themselves, where they're really expressing the fact that they haven't been given their compensation, the compensation was not fulfilled, and they use the language of the Mexican Revolution. They talk about the agrarian cause and they point out some of the contradictions in the federal government's actions in removing them from their land to build this campus. So after finding a lot of this in, in the archives and talking to colleagues in, in Mexico about this, I returned to the aerial images. And this 1946 image that I showed you a few moments ago, um, I was able to actually find some um, visual evidence of the settlements of these communities on some of these images. Um, and there's a really interesting, some interesting work that some colleagues are doing on settlement detection that I've, I've used some of those, those tools that are used a lot in archeology span and GIS. Um, to, to do some of this work. But again, this is kind of one example of how aerial images can be used as sources to kind of provide a more multi-vocal narrative and fill in parts of the story that are not necessarily included in official archives. Um, I'll, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but there's some interesting work that I'm also doing in this project about what happened to the communities after they were displaced. And this is an example of a, a housing complex that was built for them that unfortunately didn't last, was, was kind of built of poor quality and had to be demolished. So we can see on the outskirts of the campus, on the in these aerial photos, some of those, the afterlives of this campus story um, that have been lost. 
one of the things that I really hope to achieve with this kind of work and that I hope will be applicable to others is to think about how we can document places that no longer exist and use some of the methods of digital public history, um, community engagement, and shared authority to work with folks in, in these communities um, and try to help them to document stories that they'd like to document um, through community mapping exercises, virtual tours, et cetera, um, and really thinking about spatial history, but spatial history, not just of what exists now, but really peeling back the layers to um, places that, that, that have been demolished or removed and kind of erased from the official record. So to conclude, um, I, as I mentioned, one of my biggest priorities is, is that this project be portable and kind of address big questions that are applicable to other settings. Can digital tools allow us to use state and university archives to explore more ground up questions or document social processes that have been erased from the campus map we normally see? Um, I use a lot of similar strategies here on a project at George Mason or about Virginia that, Public Universities, yeah. for example. So, okay, so I'll wrap up, um, but would love to hear um, from other folks if there's sort of other applicable settings that we could apply this to, thinking critically about aerial photography as a global source base and putting it into conversation with digital humanities approaches and methods. Thank you.